Throughout the history of the mob, as far as rackets go, the numbers racket years ago was arguably one of the biggest money-making rackets of all time. The origin of the racket, sometimes referred to as the policy, can be traced back to the Morelli family and boss Giuseppe Morelli, who ran the 107th Street mob, which operated out of Manhattan, East Harlem, and the Bronx. In 1931, when the five families were created, Dutch Schultz was considered the king of the numbers racket. By 1935, the commission ordered Schultz to be hit, and on October 23, 1935, a Murder, Inc. hit team shot Schultz in the bathroom of a restaurant, and he died in a hospital a day later. One of the guys Schultz used to run the numbers racket was Ellsworth Raymond Johnson, better known as Bumpy Johnson. But their relationship was a rocky one, where they often battled for control of Harlem. With this in mind, it was said that it was easy for Bumpy's guys to pick off any of Schultz's crew, because they were the only white guys walking around Harlem. Following Schultz's death, Bumpy Johnson had an agreement with Lucky Luciano, where the mob would let Johnson control the numbers racket in Harlem, and he would hand over a percentage to them. In 1952, Bumpy Johnson was sentenced to 15 years for a conviction involving a heroin conspiracy. During this time, many of the black drug kingpins would use their money from drug profits as banks for the black number spots. You also had guys like Spanish Raymond Marquez, a Genovese associate, who was a major player with the numbers racket in Harlem. The 116th Street crew in East Harlem controlled the majority of the racket in Harlem and throughout New York City. That Tony Salerno took the racket over from Michael Coppola, his mentor. Salerno and the Genovese family made hundreds of millions from the numbers racket. I previously mentioned that besides the number of spots Salerno controlled, he taxed other spots up to 65% just to operate, which made him more than a partner in these independent spots. In early 1969, the New York City Police Commissioner, Michael J. Murphy, testified before a legislative committee regarding the numbers racket. He told the committee, syndicated crime, whether it be known as Cosa Nostra or any other name, finds the policy racket the ideal criminal activity. It is easily organized. It's popular with the public. There's a guaranteed built-in margin for profit. Deterrency, because of the protection and the security offered by the laws of search and seizure and by the recent court decisions, is difficult, and punishment is mild and hardly a deterrent. What the commissioner didn't mention is the police who received the graft, which was when they took a bribe to look the other way. And in exchange for their payment, they would tip the number spots off to any surveillance or scheduled raids. I'll talk about why in the later years, specifically around 1985, these raids took place more frequently. During the 1960s, an informant told law enforcement that Fat Tony Salerno told him he was making about $30,000 a day, money that greatly increased over the years, which was in significant contrast to the average yearly income, which was about six, dollars $7,000 in those days. There were two main numbers in New York City, the Manhattan and the Brooklyn numbers. The Manhattan number derived from the payouts for horses in the seven races at the racetrack, and the Brooklyn number came from the last three numbers of the total amount of money that at the racetrack for that day. By way of example, if the day's total was $3,729,642, the Brooklyn number for that day would be 642. Most numbers paid 600 to 1. Although cut numbers, numbers which were played the most, would pay out 500 to 1 or less. Some of the smaller number spots, if they seen a certain number was played heavily, would lay some of it off to a larger spot. Just in case the number hit, they wouldn't break their bank. In certain instances, where a number was hit big in smaller spots, they would have to borrow from a local Shylock in order to pay out. A guy like Fat Tony didn't have to worry about laying off numbers. Number guys could be found everywhere, in office buildings, factories, bars, social clubs, barbershops, etc. Housewives would play while at the grocery store, beauty parlor, on the street, or even in the hallway of their building. Harlem had the largest concentration of number players. By the 1960s, the racket had over 500,000 daily players and was estimated to be a $200 million yearly business. Betters could play a number 
by putting nickels, dimes, quarters, or dollars on a number straight or a combination where they would bet on all six possible combinations of the number, a percentage of their money would be placed on every combination. And obviously, the payout was significantly less than playing the number straight. They could also bet single action and bet on the first, second, or third number. For example, if they bet a dollar single action and hit, their payout would only be seven or eight dollars. The bookies would give the betting slips to a runner who would then take them to a number control room or the numbers bank. A runner would get paid by whoever ran the spot, and he also would sometimes get a tip if a player hit. The controllers also had to get paid, as well as the bookies, and of course, whichever cops were on the take. Naturally, the owner of the numbers bank made the lion's share. Referring back to the police graft, an interesting bit of information I found was that black-run number spots were constantly accusing the police in Harlem of raiding their spots to enrich the Italian spots. And it wasn't as if the black people only played in black-run spots. I personally been to Gambino spots where most of the customers were black. In fact, in the nickel spot, there were two black women who took the numbers from behind the glass. Speaking of which, most spots had bulletproof or some type of thick glass separating the players from the people taking the numbers. In Harlem, similar to the drug business, the number spots employed neighborhood people and gave them the opportunity to have a job. Even though illegitimate, it was still a job. Some of those jobs included being a lookout, where the person would alert the number spots to any police presence in the area. Another ethnic group to enter the numbers arena were the Cubans, who were called the Corporation and headed by Jose Miguel Battle Sr., a Cuban immigrant who came to the United States in late 1959 and quickly established himself. He opened numerous number spots throughout Harlem, which offered the Belita, where numbered balls were drawn that players would bet on. Initially, some of these spots were subjected to arson, obviously causing friction between the Cubans and Italians. Supposedly, Battle requested a meeting with Fat Tony Salerno. They met at the infamous Patsy's in East Harlem. Whether that location was picked strategically or just on principle, Fat Tony made Battle come to his neck of the woods, so to speak. During the meeting, Battle suggested a collaboration regarding gambling spots, including number spots, in which the Cubans would do all the work and give the mob a cut. Following the meeting, the mob came up with the two-block rule, a rule that still applies to this day, where a new spot had to be at least two blocks away from any existing spots. The two-block rule went trouble-free up until the early 80s. The problems began in East New York, Brooklyn, where the Lucchese's had a Belita spot at 50 Albany Avenue. That spot was raided by the police and shut down. Not long after, the Cubans associated the battle opened up their Belita spot at 75 Albany Avenue, just down the block. The Lucchese's eventually reopened their spot at 50 Albany Avenue, a move the Cubans took as a violation of the two-block rule and torched the Lucchese spot. At the time, the Lucchese boss was Tony Ducks Corallo. On February 8, 1986, the Lucchese's called the sit-down with the Cubans. As to who specifically was there, that's unknown. The meeting was held at an Upper East Side restaurant on 72nd and 3rd Avenue. That meeting turned into a shouting match with both groups spilling out onto the street. A group of Lucchese associates in a car pulled up and began throwing shots at the Cubans. Consequently, one of the Cubans, Pedro Acosta, was hit in the head with a bullet and killed. Shortly after this incident, a wiretapped conversation was recorded where a guy could be heard complaining to someone above him, stating, a couple of, he used a derogatory word for Spanish people, has set up a number spot. The person he was talking to responded, leave them have it and don't make trouble. We don't need the headaches. We got better things going for us. By this time, the crack epidemic hit New York. Raids on number spots that were mistaken for crack dens increased. As the guy mentioned, it wasn't worth the headache, and the mob eventually gave up one of their most lucrative rackets to the Cubans.